I just want to thank uh, Beryl, Judy, Kristen, and Pat, and myself for sharing um, plants today that are in the garden. I had a hard time finding anything in bloom, actually. <laughs> but, uh, um, and then uh, next month, if you'd like to um, share, um, send uh, your pictures to me um, uh, by five o'clock on uh, the Sunday before. So we'll start with Beryl. I saw Beryl. Ooh, nice. So, Mark, somebody has to show me how to get color on my iPhone camera. So, um, I cheated because I have this uh, vine growing, but the color was awful. So, picture looking at are from Annie's annuals where I bought the plant. And um, it's doing quite well at my house. Um, and it, um, I don't know any, what Amy says is true. It, it grows very, very quickly. Um, I had it in for one year and it's um, growing quite well. So I don't know if anybody has any questions. How tall is it? Oh, no. Um, let's see, it's, it's growing, the maximum space that I gave it is roughly about 10 feet, and um, it's gotten that high. Wow. So you're pruning it a lot? Uh, yeah, actually I'm learning, um, I'm I'm learning, Kristen. Um, what one thing that I am learning is that it flowers are new growth, so I can prune it almost as much as I want to, hmm. and um, you know I'll still get the flowers. Um, um, I'm not pruning it as much yet as I will now on. If you don't know the cold tolerance, I could go to Annie's website, but I'm just asking. Yeah, I don't know. You don't know. Yeah, because you're not cold. I don't have to worry about it. I, I know. I just don't pay attention to that. I know. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Thanks, Beryl. How about did it get? I'm sorry, I missed it. Oh, I, I'd be curious to know if you water it very much. Oh, that, um, I don't, I don't give it a lot of water, but I guess I do give it, um, it gets a little bit of water, uh, especially warm weather, mm. just so to keep the soil from completely drying out a lot. But what is your average daytime temperature so that, I mean, you're, you're much cooler. Yeah. So my is bed is, is this, you're like 75 degrees as a high. It, it, it's things average anymore. You know, it was almost a hundred degrees where I lived last week. And that's definitely not um, normal. Um, I'm not really sure how to answer your question, Chris. Well, I know you're getting hotter. We're all getting hotter. But um, in the summer, when you have your fog every day, I mean, it got hot in August, I think, which was early for us this year. But um, it, yeah, normally, also, though, until August, it was, what, about 70, 75 every day? Um, Mark, can you help me with this? Um, well, we've had a little bit of a hot spell, but it, yeah, we don't get very many uh, days over 90 degrees. Very few. Oh. Do you get and many days? Like you say, more often in the 70s. Yeah. 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 You yeah, don't Kristen, get, you get I think, Yeah, in the 70s. Um, and we haven't had our normal thought lately. I've been watching more as for the last two months because the skies have been clear and um, you know that's really unusual for where I live 
Um, Mars has been absolutely fantastically bright, unbelievably bright. If any of you have a chance to check it out, um, you know, plus all the other planet and stars and um, because it's been unusually clear. Beryl, the website says that it's fragrant. Is it overwhelming or just you get waves of it? I'm sorry, you mean the growth? No, no, the flowers. It says that it's fragrant. Is it overwhelming or just barely I there? That. I didn't what? even know that, Judy. Well, that, that's what her website says. I wouldn't say it was overwhelming because even I can smell things that are overwhelming and I you're couldn't smell it. Oh, you're okay. gonna stick your nose in that barrel. Oh, have it, Mark? Pardon? When you I grew it, it I, I never noticed any smell. Oh, okay. That's but good. I mean, yeah. Good. Well, um, Judy, I don't think it, I don't, I really don't think it had any, actually. Hmm. Okay. Okay. We're gonna have to move on because we've spent 10 minutes on this plant. <laughs> Okay. okay. Thanks, Beryl. Okay, Judy, come on. Oh, okay. So um, I got some plants that I need to put in the ground, but this osteospermum I'd seen a while back, it is um, the Zion Copper Amethyst, and I love the, the flowers on it. It's grown as an annual in cold winter areas, but here I think it'll last. It's kind of a reliable perennial. It is uh, drought tolerant, grows to about two by two feet, and um, it's supposed to make a, a great cut flower too. So you do have to protect it from frost, and it may go a little bit deciduous, but I love the color, and I got a purple osteospermum to grow with it. The next one, I, some of you may have it. Uh, anyone else grow the iris unguicularis? Yes. Yeah, I do. Yeah, it's a great plant. It was given to me by a um, member of Western Court, Elizabeth Garbett, and it just started blooming in the last week and a half. And like they say, if you cut back the leaves by a third, then you can see the flowers because they stay quite low on the plant. But they're such a nice surprise when they start blooming. Um, I'd like to add to that, that out here in Danville, it grows bone dry. Yes, yeah. I do not water it. Yeah. yeah. Where do you live, Judy? I live in Menlo Park. Okay. Yeah. Well, you we know, got, we get, I think we get higher, hotter, but it's, and, you do. Yeah. And I was surprised it grows dry, did a piece and was. It, it's in bright shade, but it never gets any water all summer. In fact, I think that's um, one of the well, things. In Richmond, it flowers many months later than it does where you live. Oh, okay. All right, next. Nice. Uh, oh. This is a plant I got from someone at Western Hort. Um, the, the Rodans, they used to grow clematis. Do people know them, remember them? Anyway, this is Thailanum paniculatum, and that's the plant there. It is a, a succulent, and it, um, where's my notes here? Yeah, succulent, uh, native to North and South America and the Caribbean. And it's also known, I uh, met it as Jewels of Opar, which I think is a wonderful name. So it's an annual or tender perennial and it's supposed to have lime green leaves, although mine isn't particularly lime green, but the tiny little flowers are about uh, maybe a half inch at the most. And they're pretty prolific actually, but it, it's great because this is a hot south facing wall in a mm -hmm. narrow bed and it reliably recedes and I get the um, flowers every year. Evidently, it can be eaten in salad or on sandwiches, and the seeds are tiny but nutritious, is what I read somewhere. Um, cool. And it makes an excellent cut flower. Nice. Right, next. Um, the flower on the left is one that is in bloom right now. I got it at the Botanic Garden, and it is one of those Ooh. nice little uh, oxaluses. It doesn't... Um, say it weed about at all. Uh, it's from South Africa, uh, deciduous and summer dormant with no water at all. Mm. So it does need kind of bright shade or morning sun and uh, it just blooms reliably, just started blooming. And the one on the right is one that a cutting that I got from my sister in Santa Barbara actually 
which is a really interesting plant. It's a um, Euphorbia xylophylloides. And this is against a south facing wall in a pot. Uh, I kind of give it a spritz every once in a while when I'm watering something nearby. But it's interesting as the new growth comes in, it comes in that kind of orange on top. Um, it's supposed to bloom, mine's has never bloomed, but it, it's kind of like a ribbon succulent. It's, it's, it's very interesting and it's very low care. What do the blooms look like? They're supposed to be yellow, little yellow flowers, but like I said, mine's has never bloomed. Okay, next. How tall does the succulent get? Uh, this one gets, uh, mine's is about two feet, and I think wow. it can get a little bit. It can get tree size, evidently, in Madagascar. Yeah, yeah, I think in, in habitat, it can grow actually quite large. Um, but mine's is never, mine's is in a pot, and uh, it'll even take um, some coal down into the 20s. Kind of nice. Oh. All right. And last but not least, I, my Brunsfeldia is blooming and I was really surprised because it usually blooms in the springtime. And uh, this last week, all of a sudden it was putting out blooms and I guess it's supposed to be able to do that from um, spring through winter, I guess. So um, I didn't have a pale, a pale purple one, but uh, on the day that it um, blooms, it's that deep purple and then, um, the day after, I think it's, let's see. It's yesterday. a pale. Oh, this must be yesterday. The middle one is yesterday, sorry. And then uh, today is usually more of a pale lavender. And then by the third day, it's white. And uh, It's nice, it's fragrant. Mm. And um, I've had the plant, it, it grows well for me, but I was surprised to see it blooming again. Judy, you want to ask you about the Pardon? Uh, the axalis, are you planning to put it in the ground? I put it in a pot. It, it, they're, they're bulbs, and um, it do, does very well in a pot. And I, um, it's easy to, to kind of watch the flowers when they bloom. So I wasn't planning on putting it on the ground. Has anyone else grown it in the ground? I am. Uh, does it spread at all? No, not horribly. Not at not, all. Not no, I've got others that are blooming now too, but they're a little more aggressive. Uh, okay. Okay. No, I, I, I don't know. It's one of those things I keep in pot. All right, Perfect. I think that's it. Kristen, you're on. Okay, so uh, this is Helianthus angustifolia. It's not, uh, well, there was a flower on it still today. Mm -hmm. uh, angustifolia is one of the swamp helianthus. And I'm not even sure this is truly Angustifolius anymore because I think it might have crossed with Maximilianii. And Maximilianii is a, um, a high tall grass prairie plant, uh, but, the, it, but, I, I, but this requires water where Maximilianii does not. Uh, it, but the amount of water that it needs is not uh, exorbitant because it survives during the drought periods and I cut my water to uh, less than half and it doesn't get as tall but it certainly blooms and um, and even then I know some people have commented I think on my Facebook page the surprise that I um, only give my plants four minutes of water overhead a day and that's in Danville where it's very hot. Uh, it's a great showstopper. This is near the street and the brake screech, <laughs> people drive by. I have this also and it, it's really a nice plant to bloom this time of year because nothing else in the garden is blooming. Mine's just over though, I, I have none left. Yeah, next. This is um, Cypella Peruviana. I bought this plant at Suncrest many years ago. Of course, I didn't put it where it wanted to go, and I let things like this go to seed, and then it goes on the chipping pile, and then it gets put all at any place in the garden where I need chips. And this decided to come up between the street, and that's the driveway to the right of it, and that's the street uh, to the back of it, uh, and the curb. And uh, I find it interesting that a lot of bulbs seem to like that kind of a location. 
many of my bulbs move to uh, the edge of the garden. It drives me a little crazy, either to the walkway or the curb. And of course, you don't want it in the walkway because I always get yelled at by people that I need to keep this, the uh, sidewalk clear, which is not something I care about. But at any rate, so this is where it decided to come and it blooms every year from here. It's been 10 years. I'm very surprised because I've lost it everywhere else. Hmm. And you water it all? It's on the other side of the sprinkler head. So if the sprinkler head is dripping, which I can't tell, uh, maybe it gets some water from there, yeah. But not a lot because this is also near the redwood trees of my neighbor. Don't mm. get me on that subject. <laughs> And uh, those roots are everywhere. Mm. And it, but I will say this, I have a um, Chitalpa there and mm -hmm. um, it also partially shades it. So that might be of help to it. Next. Okay. I can do enter. Okay. Oops, wrong way. All right. Okay. So this just stopped blooming. Also, this is Clematis maxowitzianii. Um, this is an autumn blooming clematis. Unlike Ellen, I have a lot going on still in my garden because my goal has always been to have year round bloom. My paper whites have been up since the end of September, just to give you some interest to see. And um, my, my mentor was uh, Wayne Roderick, who had bulbs that bloomed year round in his garden, but I had to have all kinds of plants. Uh, this was not, again, an original planting. It's under my um, persimmon tree, and there's a brick patio under around the tree, and the ger seed germinated there. And once this plant is in, mm. it's very hard to get rid of, and and I'd stop going to war with it, and I just cut it back to the ground every year. But it's a gorgeous thing to have blooming in the fall, and it's fragrant. And the only thing is, you have to get back, uh, get it out of the way before it goes to seed, because it does seed about. Not too aggressively, but it does. And that's all. And Pat Lay, you're on. Are you here? Let's stay. The microphone. There I am. There um, she is. This is a Hollywood juniper. Um, I got two in the garden. And for years, um, I've been trying to get it um, recognized as a heritage tree hmm. because it's um it's about 75 years, about old. years, old, years old um it's um it's about um we keep it at about 45 feet Woo! <laughs> but well it, i mean it grows quite fast but it's um I have another one at the other end of this little wall and I think they were put in as little tiny bushes when the house was built. Oh neat. So when um, you visit your garden. Yes, it's, it's a lovely garden. I'd be very happy if you came and looked at my garden. I'm very Oh proud. lovely, okay. Well, make note of that. Mark. Um, it's it, up until now um, heritage trees in Los Altos Hills have had to be oaks, but they've changed that in the last year. And now any significant tree can be put forward. And I, I reckon this one's significant. But this is the first time a private person in, in the 65 five years since Los Altos Hills was started, who ha has applied to have a tree made a heritage tree. Hmm. So I'm, I'm very pleased with myself. You should be. It's a beautiful Congratulations. Tree. Yes. How often do you have it trimmed? Well, I have McClanahan's come, uh, look after all the trees in the garden. They come around once a year and do what's necessary. And one of the funny things um, of, I had to present the tree to the town council to get accepted. And um, somebody said, 
if anybody wants to build, because it, it's a, we have a flat acre in Los Altos Hills, which is, I mean, the house will be torn down, obviously. And most builders just come and, it's a little ranch house, and most builders come and clear the property. So one of the questions that I was asked was, will the, will the new owner be able to afford to keep up the tree? And I said, for goodness sake, a flat acre in Los Altos Hills <laughs> where he can put up in excess of 10,000 square feet, he isn't going to quibble <laughs> at the cost of keeping a tree pruned. Oh. So. Beautiful. Thank mm. you for, uh, apologize for the um, misspelling your name. Well, but thank you. Sharing. No problem. No problem. Okay. That's all. Okay, this is mine, and this is Calma Grostas, Acuta Flora, Carl Forrester. And um, one reason I have this in here is because I'm going to divide it. If anybody wants uh, a piece of that, just let me know. Um, it has, it's showy all year round pretty much. It's, it's, it has the low foliage, but the um, stalks from the last year are still up when the new ones come up. Um, and, uh, I love the nice vertical, um, oh, habit that it has and it's, uh, gets watered with everything else. So no special needs there. And this plant I really love. This is Lysinia, though I guess now it's, uh, uh, Corothrogeny, something like that. And, um, it is a California native and it, um, spreads pretty quickly to about three or four feet and uh, only a couple about maybe four inches tall. Um, I, I have that in my dry garden right now so it only gets watered maybe once a week um, during this time of year um, and uh, the rest of the year it doesn't. But I've also had in a container where I had you know a big tree and this cascaded over the edge and it was just gorgeous. It has a really long blooming season and uh, I'm sure I got this at uh, or I know I got this at Annie's so Anyway, nice plant. Oh, okay, so um, next month, I think we already mentioned this. If um, anybody has anything of interest, please uh, email me um, the Sunday before. And November 15th is um, our uh, regular meeting is on the 16th. And um, on, and we are, our Carlos Magdalena from um, um, Kew Gardens, the plant Messiah will be talking, which um, promises to be a really exciting, interesting um, program as well. And, but he is um, going to be talking on the following Saturday, which is the 21st at 10 a.m. So keep that in mind. And then um, we have a short, uh, announcement so on the 16th mark where's your hat just reaching for it <laughs> <laughs> okay go ahead we're having a party 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 on the 16th and uh we'll have the plant forum and uh cocktails and hors d'oeuvres and a plant forum from 637 of course this is all virtually virtual so it's bring your own uh booth. and a boatload of prizes i think and we have prizes, um, but fun and games, well, 6.30 to 7, we'll have the um, plant forum and um, share hors d'oeuvres and cocktails. And then at 7, we'll have some fun and games, and there is prizes. I'll, I'll um, show those after we stop sharing the screen. Um, prizes will be involved. And then um, we'll end the evening with a toast to good riddance to 20 and all the best to a better 2021. So hopefully you guys will start thinking about your toasts um, soon. And uh, the hats, we are uh, right here. You are invited. And Mark has his, Mark is um, also, I'll, I'll um, pin both of our screens in a minute. Um, Mark is also the uh, co-chair of the party uh, festivities. And uh, Dotson, but I don't know, I, don't, I haven't seen Dotson um, this today yet so um 
So we're wearing a hat. We stole this from the uh, Succulent Society, which does this every year at their party. And it's always fun to see all the different uh, hats and stuff. And then um, we'll put everybody's uh, name in it in, in a hat um, and do a drawing for the anybody that wears a hat. And um, so keep that in mind, mark it on your calendar. Pin, there's Mark's hat. His, his is done with actual real flowers, if you can imagine that. Um, and then I'll show you some of the uh, enticements. So bring your, uh, well, Mark has a uh, game of guess the guard. And then we'll get go into a little um, rooms in smaller groups so you can chat and stuff. And we have a little game to do that too. Okay, so we have, um, uh, you see that? Annie's gift okay. certificates to Annie's annuals. We have little winner pendants. <laughs> Who made those? Well, who else? <laughs> There's only one creative person on our team. <laughs> They're not done yet, so you know, they'll be all different. So, anyway, um, the only announcement I had is that. Um, meeting um, or uh, annual renewal membership will be sent via um, email instead of mail like we've done. If you get the bulletin um, by mail, you'll get your uh, renewal notice by mail. Should we mention the, that the, um, the meeting, the speaker, there is a speaker November and it's a different day than usual. Did you say that already? I did that, but you can read re oh, it. Okay, sorry, I, I missed that part. Okay, okay I was probably yeah. fumbling from that. Yeah, parties on the, the 16th and then the 21st, which is the following Saturday at 10, will be uh, Carlos Magdalena, the plant messiah, will be um, speaking. Let's um, hear from Kristen then. She'll be um, introducing Chad. So, um, Chad Hughesby spoke to us, or Husby. Chad, how do you say your name, Husby or Hughesby? They both work, but usually I go by Husby, yes. Yeah, I thought so. Chad Husby is uh, the plant uh, curator for the Fairchild Botanical Garden in Florida. And I was introduced to him initially through a Martin Grantham, and we had him speak, if you can remember, on horsetails, which there was nobody else in the world who could speak on that subject except for Chad. And he, and I, I have to say, I've had people come back to me. That guy who spoke about horsetails was amazing. So you know, Chad. At any rate, I got to see him in February, the, uh, actually late January, before all this COVID stuff started. And I was so impressed. Chad, as curator, will accept all kinds of plants and has one of the most amazing plant collections I have ever seen at Fairchild. Uh, if you ever have an opportunity to go, I highly recommend it. There are greenhouses in the ground. He's got a great Malvasia collection, which all of you know would draw me there. And it's one of the best ones I've ever seen in, in my life. And, um, and we were talking about the fact that botanical gardens are challenged these days to keep their plants because of the cost of, of the costs that they have in raising money. And for some reason, Fairchild is one of the blessed botanical gardens that doesn't have as much of a problem with this. So Chad was telling me that he got all these plants out of the Atlanta Botanical Garden, shipped in trucks because they decided to get rid of part of their collections because it was just too much to manage. And Chad said yes. And so I thought it would be good to talk about what's going on at the, in the botanical garden world and Chad said he would do that. So thank you so much, Chad, for coming, and I really appreciate it. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here, Kristen. Great to see you all. And if, yes, yeah, I think it was like four years ago when I had a chance to speak in person on that uh, very obscure and specific topic of horsetails. So this time I'm going to talk about something on a whole other end of things, which is the actually international issues with, uh, with plant exchange and how that affects us as who love plants and gardening and, and also the botanic gardens uh, that we 
sometimes interact with and um, and yeah, and it's, uh, you know, as, as, as Kristen said, I, I've, you know, I've spent my life basically working on plant introductions from all over the world. And um, when I first, actually, I even did my PhD kind of based on the idea that I would do science and have a chance to introduce giant horsetails into cultivation. So when early in that process, about almost 20 years ago now, uh, I attended a, a talk actually at the garden where I work now at Fairchild about uh, this very topic that the changing legal issues with plant exchange and how people do botany in other countries. And uh, I was just terrified. I, I, from that talk, I thought, wow, am I gonna have to be a lawyer to work with plants from now on? And can I just not share plants with people without having a whole bunch of strings attached ever again? And, and so I decided to, uh, instead of just be scared of that, um, to learn more about it and fortunately learned that it's not nearly as scary as, as sometimes is presented. So I, I'm going to focus um, today on the aspects that are probably least known and most obscure, but kind of also deeper on these issues. Um, I know a lot of us have heard of things like CITES uh, or the US Department of Agriculture's uh, rules for importing plants and for whatnot. I'm not gonna mention those. Um, but we can talk about them later if you'd like to. Uh, but they're, those are things that, those issues are things we can't really avoid and they're, or really have a, much of a role in how they work. We just kind of have to follow the rules. Um, but the stuff I'm gonna talk about is the stuff, are, are the aspects of plant exchange and especially affecting botanical gardens and people collecting overseas that, that we have we have some freedom to interact with and to and to adopt to a changing world. So um, that's why I'm gonna. They're also the things that are the most, uh, I think, the most interesting. So uh, I will uh, get started here, unless anyone has any questions first. Okay, first um, I'd like to mention that stuff that we all know as as gardeners is that plants are you know the best thing to exchange that in the world you know because. You can make more of them and share them and they're just, and still have the original plant. It's not like gold where, you know, if I give you some of my gold, I have less gold. You know, if I give you a cutting of a plant, you know, you still got your plants and I've got my plants and we can both enjoy them as much as if we hadn't shared. And in fact, enjoy them even more because we shared. And, um, and to, make that even better, plants don't really go get old, which is uh, something that uh, those of you who are out in, in redwood country know that, um, you know, we have these trees that are thousands of years old that uh, you can take a cutting from uh, and graft it onto a seedling and it will a thousand, you know, even a, an ancient bristlecone pine from Southern California even, and it will grow just like it was a seedling again. Um, they don't, they don't just break down over time. They can, you know, they get big and they get diseases and there are various things that come with just, you know, getting bigger in size or just having more time to interact with the environment and whatnot. But it's not just plants don't, you know, they found that the bristlecone pines even, you know, they couldn't physiologically distinguish between a 5,000 year old bristlecone pine and a 20 year old one when they did a study uh, 20 years ago on, on them. And um, so they're, so they're just plants are the ultimate shareable renewable resource, which is one of the things that we love so much about them. And because of that, during the history of, of plants, they've uh, you know, been one of the things that people have taken from place to place because useful plants aren't just to be found, you know, equally useful plants aren't found everywhere on, in the world. Some, some places have a lot of plants that are good for food naturally and fiber and uh, fruit and all those things. Other places don't have as much. Um, some countries have a lot of diversity, some don't. And so as, as human beings spread over the surface of the earth, they brought their useful plants with them and they shared them as they, as they went and found new ones and different communities would, would send them to different places and they'd be traded from community to community. And the most, perhaps the most dramatic example of that was um, when the, ancient peoples in the Pacific, the, the, the Pacific Islanders who, who uh, the Polynesians who colonized all those incredibly far flung islands across the vast Pacific Ocean, brought what are called their canoe plants, uh, plants like breadfruit and, and, and taro and uh, 
yams, uh, all, and they, they would have, they had this little group of plants that were necessary for sustenance. And they knew that the next island they may come to may not have many food plants or, or medicine plants and whatnot. So they, would, or, so they brought this kind of survival kit of plants with them. Um, that they that, that were staples in their culture, and uh, and that's and so every every island in the Pacific that they that they reached were uh, you can find these crops, and then you can find over time they selected different varieties of breadfruit on each island and whatnot. It's pretty pretty wonderful and amazing process, and um, and human beings have continued that process quite far into the modern age. Um, in fact, right up, you know, it's been fairly extensive and fairly free right up till about, you know, the 90s, early 90s. And, um, and even, you know, back, back in the 60s and 70s, even, they, there was the famous Green Revolution of Dr. Norman Borlaug, who uh, actually developed some, some improved varieties of, of wheat that overcame some traditional problems uh, with reduct you know, that had limited production of these grains and helped to save perhaps a couple hundred million people in India and Pakistan um, from starvation when a lot of people were predicting a very bad fate in those countries. And, and he freed, these were not patented. They were developed for the very purposes of feeding people. He developed them in Mexico and then and for actually just preventing hunger. They were just totally for, for, the, good of, for the good of humankind. And um, so this, uh, this culture of free sharing uh, was, uh, came under a little bit of threat starting in the 1980s, um, but there were attempts to uh, keep it going uh, by a couple of uh, international agreements. One of them was called the International Undertaking on Plant Genetic Resources in 1983. And it was an effort by countries that had a lot of biodiversity um, to preserve this, the, the traditional reciprocity, the traditional exchange of uh, where they would share, you know, their their richness of, of biodiversity with countries that had more technology for dealing with them, more breeding experience and whatnot, and then they would freely get uh, improved varieties back, like it happened during the during the Green Revolution, and um, and there were various attempts to kind of preserve this more open open system, right up until the 80s, and uh, but at the Despite that, there were there were there was growing threat to that to that system, uh, basically due to advances in biotechnology and the sorts of uh, the sorts of regimes that the Western countries, like like the U.S. and Europe, uh, tended to use with technology, basically intellectual property rights. Uh, and so, over time, the the West uh, started to the you know the Western countries uh, had been creating a regime where they would patent or trademark um, improved varieties. And, and probably we've all seen plants in, in various nurseries that say they're patented or trademarked and they say, you know, you're not allowed officially to propagate them and share them and you have to have a little license. And if you are a nursery and you know, and you have to, and it, to be able to even propagate them and then have, share royalties with, with the breeder who, who patented them. And uh, this system, you know, started out, you know, in the early 20th century, and then it got stronger uh, right up until about 1991. Um, and the and the U.S. Uh, was at the forefront of this. We actually pushed uh, an annex, something in addition to the international undertaking, this this uh, treaty that was supposed to to preserve free exchange. But we said, well, free exchange except our patents. And uh, so that obviously made a lot of the biodiversity rich countries uh, not very happy because it's like, oh, we're supposed to give you all these nice plants that we have growing in our country and then you're going to patent them and make money and sell them back to us. And they didn't like that. Obviously, nobody would. Um, and there were also uh, back in uh, around 1980, there was a change in the patent system that allowed living things to be patented. They patented a genetically modified bacterium for cleaning up oil spills. It's a famous Supreme Court case uh, because before that you couldn't patent living things, and uh, so that that opened the floodgates for for a lot of changes with plants as well. And um, and there were also a big deal like uh, there were there was a lot of uh, excitement in the 1980s, especially about uh, pharmaceuticals from plants uh, that could be you know that then big pharma giants from the developed world. Uh, 
so-called developed world. I won't, I want to, I know it's a little bit of a charged term, but um, the, the countries with more of that kind of technology, uh, they, they would, you know, find, go bioprospecting as they say, you know, bring back some, sometimes in the old days uh, before 1990 or so, botanists who were trying to help fund their, their taxonomy research, their research on how to name plants would sometimes help you a little extra money by bringing plant samples back for pharmaceutical companies to, uh, to then extract chemicals from them and see if there were any, anything promising in them. And so there was the famous movie Medicine Man and a lot of the conservation organizations back then were trying to play up the idea that if countries would preserve their rainforests, then maybe they would find you know, the cure for cancer, uh, that kind of thing. Um, so as, as a motivation to conserve, to conserve their, their natural resources. And, uh, but so all of those forces made these, these countries in the developing world, uh, in the world where it, with basically less highly technological countries, um, decided they've got to start um, kind of pushing back against the, against the kind of the, the Western, Northern, more, more uh, technological, technologically advanced countries. And so what they did was they, um, they decided to start saying these plants are basically within our borders and we're going to start controlling them because you're, you've kind of broken the old tradition of sharing back when we share them with you. So they actually in 1991 added, added their own uh, retaliatory little addition to the plant, to the uh, international undertaking um, saying basically we have control over our plant resources and you can't just come and take them and, and patent them anymore. And, um, and so this is just kind of a summary so that I don't, don't wanna read, read all of these. So I'll leave them as kind of a, a reference to you um, as kind of a summary of what, what, I've, what I was saying verbally. Um, but so basically the, the idea is that, you know, the, the freedom of, of exchange is being enclosed more and more through the eighties by intellectual property rights. And so the, uh, the backlash to this process in the North of kind of gaining more, of, of ex exerting more and more uh, ownership over, over basically products made from biodiversity, from plant biodiversity especially, um, was this what's called the Convention on Biological Diversity, um, which was, uh, came into force uh, right at the end of 1993. It's the famous Rio Summit is, the, is its nickname. And uh, the US famously did not, uh, did not directly participate, I don't think. Um, we did, the US did end up signing it under the Clinton administration, but it was never, um, never ratified. Um, and the basis of the, of the so we're, we're, I think, I think now the US and the Vatican are the only uh, countries in the world that aren't uh, parties to this at the moment. Um, so the, so this is based on what's called the grand bargain at the time, which was where the countries with a lot of biodiversity uh, uh, mainly in the tropics, uh, though you know some of some countries like the U.S. we have a lot because we're big and and it's kind of a middle latitude as well, but nowhere near as much as say Brazil. Um, they commit to to conserve their biodiversity or at least to put structures in place to do so in exchange for uh, then the 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 countries that have the the more the more developed world countries then ex promise to give them sovereign control over their genetic resources so they could they could make the rules over how to access them and uh, so that with the idea being that then theoretically they could make money you know saying okay here's the you know we'll make a deal with this pharmaceutical company and hopefully and each country thought well hopefully we'll be the con country that has a blockbuster pharmaceutical that will make billions of dollars and then we can use that money to you know uh, conserve our natural our rainforests and whatnot and um, and so this was when the official end of this idea of common heritage that plants weren't weren't something that was that was subject to a you know they, they weren't they weren't basically property of individual governments or corporations the old way they weren't subject to either inter, intellectual property or or you know basically total government exclusion um, that was the end of that and so now plants were subject both to intellectual property claims and sovereign governmental uh, strict control claims. Um, and, and this is this covered, this agreement covered what's what called in situ genetic resources. So there's some legal technical terms here that in situ just means where it's found naturally. So a plant, it wouldn't be, it doesn't technically apply to something found in your garden or um, 
you know, in a, you know, basically in some place where it was planted artificially, it would just be things that are found in their natural state. And uh, so it's, an, it's not like CITES is, a, is, an, is an agreement that goes, goes back to the 60s and 70s. Um, and it's, uh, it's actually a, a legally enforced framework um, that different countries have to put in place a specific legal framework to enforce a specific legal system internationally that applies to specific plants and everybody's agreed to a specific legal framework. The Convention on Biological Diversity doesn't make any specific, um, doesn't create a specific system like that. It just, which makes it very hard to understand and complicated because it's, it's, you know, people talk about being a legal, a legal thing. It's a legal uh, international agreement. It's, they call it legally binding, but then there's nothing specific that's being bound in a sense. It's just because the, the countries that, that are parties to it in the, in the, in the biodiversity rich countries wanted to be able to make their own rules. They didn't want the, the uh, developed world to be saying, this is how you're gonna you know, dictate, this is how the international system is going to work even though a lot of them wanted to say that. So they wanted to say, okay, each of our countries is gonna make our own rules. You're not gonna tell us how. So some countries made rules, uh, some countries did not. And some countries made strict rules, some countries made easy rules. So there's a whole a bunch of diversity uh, of rules, uh, which makes it also complicated. And so pre-convention collections, meaning collections that were say in, bio, in bio, botanical gardens or in private gardens or in germplasm banks, like the seed banks, like the USDA has, has seed banks for all sorts of different crops uh, in, in different parts of the country. All of those were uh, excluded from before 1993, uh, when that came into force in December at the end of very end of 1993. And then anything collected after that would just be up to whatever arrangement was made between the collector and the country of origin. So stuff after that may or may not be restricted, um, but stuff before it, everybody agreed. You know, very, uh, there's kind of a, a rule in international law that a tradition that you don't make laws retroactive, same with our laws, you know, so that generally they don't go and, you don't go and uh, start, you know, uh, incarcerating people for driving, you know, over the speed limit after you change the speed limit. Um, and then uh, something that was happening just after this, uh, that was in the background, but then came uh, to the fore just after the Convention on Biological Resources is uh, what's called the TRIPS Agreement, uh, which I think is a great, little acronym because it kind of was one of the things that was kind of tripping up the old system of uh, free exchange. Um, trade related, related intellectual property something. So it's, it has to do with um, intellectual property rights, yes. Um, so it was, um, this was, re agreeing to this was required for membership in the World Trade Organization. Uh, so, and the U.S. was very strict about that, you know, back in the, in the 90s, the U.S. could basically do whatever it wanted internationally. The Cold War was over and the U.S. was the 800 pound gorilla in the world and still is to some extent, but it was much more so back then. And, uh, and so the U.S. could basically, you know, by saying you can't join the World Trade Organization unless you agree to the, to the TRIPS agreement, uh, that was basically, you know, it's like, you're going to be pu severely punished if you don't do this. So everybody ended up signing up. And uh, so one of the requirements of the TRIPS agreement is that you have some sort of system to patent plant varieties. And uh, like you technically don't have to patent, be able to patent plants per se, but you know, you do have to be able to plant, you know, have, have something that's just like basically a, a typical Western system. So it, uh, even a lot of countries that didn't want to do that, they were forced to do so. And uh, and so what we what we've ended up here uh, with is a, is uh, a, a basically a new sort of intellectual property being created over that period of time from about 1980 through the early 90s. And uh, and so this is a nice summary from a. a Professor Sabrina Safran, who's an international lawyer, who's actually uh, spent uh, time negotiating on behalf of the US government uh, for one of these treaties, um, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. And, um, but she, he wrote a couple of uh, excellent articles, which I have links to at the end. And if any of you wanna read them, uh, she, uh, one of them was an award-winning article in international law about, about how this all came to be. And, um, 
and so and so basically it's this it's a process she called hyper ownership basically people the the countries in the develop in the developed world are claiming the international intellectual property rights over plants and in the biodiversity rich countries they're saying no we 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 have the right to control access to our plants and then this brings us to botanic gardens uh which because botanic gardens uh, most of them at least uh, all but maybe one that I know of, uh, don't have lawyers on staff. This was kind of uh, difficult to handle uh, because uh, most plant people I know, probably including most of us here, including myself until I was kind of forced into it, you know, the last thing we wanted to do was become lawyers and, and have to learn uh, about international law and, and, uh, and complex, uh, you know, kind of muddy treaties and all that and, and all the history of this stuff. We just want to grow plant, beautiful plants, exchange them and, and you know, make the world a little more beautiful and interesting. And um, so, uh, but botanic gardens were kind of afraid. Uh, what are we going to do uh, in this new era? What does this mean for us? And so a few of the leading gardens, uh, in, especially in the UK, sort of took the lead, um, especially Kew Gardens, took the lead in, in providing a framework uh, that other gardens, that they suggested other gardens should follow. And, um, and so one of the things that, that some of these gardens were really afraid of was because when this uh, new treaty came into force in the early 90s, they were afraid that now uh, biotech companies are going to say, oh, these old collections in botanic gardens are free for the pickings and we you know, it's going to be hard to get into countries of origin now, the biodiversity rich countries. So, but we can just go to the botanic gardens and say, hey, these are pre-convention plants. We can just go bioprospect in your collections. And so they said to prevent that, they said, we've got to start restricting access to our botanic garden collections. And this especially happened in Europe to start with, because remember the US did not ratify this treaty. So we were kind of, uh, it didn't really, the we didn't really have the, the the kind of impetus from the government to do the the governments in these other countries weren't really telling the gardens what to do yet, um, but they were kind of wanting to preempt that and figure out what they were going to do uh, on their own. And also, so they didn't want to endanger their relationships with these countries overseas by, you know, if gardens were seen as being the places where biotech companies and pharmaceutical companies were were prospecting, then of course countries wouldn't want them to, you know, wouldn't want to be able to let them collect plants and bring them back just so that they could be. Uh, patented or something. So what they did was they developed what are called material transfer agreements, um, MTAs, which are something that came from the biotech world, the pharmaceutical world, um, which is so if you're working on some new technology and you, or new project and you want to tell somebody, you know, you want to share some of it with, with some colleague for collaboration, you, you often make an agreement with them that, you know, well, you can do this and that, but you can't do this with this. And you need to agree to, you know, keep this a secret or not keep that a secret. And, you know, and, and so it's a, it's, it's a contract. And, um, and so they did this with plants, basically saying that, you know, a lot of these early uh, material transfer agreements, many of which are still uh, used in, in some of these gardens, not many in the US yet, but um, a few. It would say something like if you, you know, you agree to get these, you know, we're, we're sharing this, you know, for these purposes for, you know, research, education or whatever you promise not to share it with anyone else without our permission, you promise not to sell it, stuff like that. You promise not to let anybody extract DNA out of it. So, you know, and forever you have to make a promise. Basically this plant is, uh, you know, kind of forever uh, restricted. Um, and and they would say that also usually these gardens would, would often say you, you're supposed to share any benefits you get from these plants, often very broadly defined with the garden that they came from. So, you know, um, since it's always, it was usually very ba vaguely defined, it's, you know, problems are, you know, would arise like for those of us who actually read those contracts to say, well, you know, do we have to, you know, if we, see a beautiful flower in the morning, you know, how do we call up the garden and say, yeah, I, I just want to share with you this amazing beauty that I experienced this morning because they just said any benefits and, and uh, you know, it's kind of hard to, hard to live up to such a broadly uh, written contract, but they, people still signed them left and right and filed them away usually and didn't look at them again. And, um, 
And so these policy changes first came, as I mentioned, to Western European gardens mostly, um, and gardens in Australia and Canada also uh, were early because they, they're all kind of in a similar, a similar orbit of, uh, in, term, in terms of garden policies and whatnot. And uh, US gardens uh, didn't, didn't do that generally and, and neither did many gardens in many other parts of the world. And um, just for uh, the, these kind of changes kind of paralleled some, some changes that happened early in the, kind of were foreshadowed in changes early in the 20th century. Uh, Frank Meyer, who was famous for the Meyer lemon, it's named after him, who was one of uh, David Fairchild's favorite plant explorers for the US Department of Agriculture, um, who, who spent a lot of time prospecting for interesting plants in China and whatnot. After, after the First World War, there were a lot of new regulations. There was a lot of, uh, a lot of issues with regard to, you know, seeing new plants as kind of, there was a lot of anti-immigration uh, kind of sentiment after the First World War because, you know, the US had gotten involved in this European war and it seemed to, you know, nobody knew why. It turned out, it seemed to have turned out badly. And, and the US had, that had been fairly open before, um, started to go inward and David Fairchild uh, had been publishing actually a little newsletter uh, for years called Our Plant Immigrants and all of a sudden the USDA said, oh, you shouldn't really say that anymore. That's not really. And then his uh, Frank Meyer uh, was just all seeing a lot of his work kind of under threat and that would have, he would have a much harder time, uh, you know, bringing in new plant introductions. And, you know, he wrote to, to, to his boss, David Fairchild saying that times certainly are sad and mad from a scientific and from a scientific point of view, so utterly unnecessary. So we we feel those things at times. Um, and uh, another uh, quote that kind of I think brings some of the feeling of these kind of changes that were happening in the plant world for many of us who uh, who were who've been watching them happen. Um, you know, like there's been a lot of. Uh, changes like collections of herbarium specimens have just crashed uh, in terms of their numbers since the early 90s and a lot of other activities have become so so much more difficult. Um, this is a quote from uh, Stefan Zweig, who was a great man of letters in, in, uh, in Germany, in the German language, um, and who was lamenting how, you know, the, the world wars, uh, which he just lived through and, and saw as just this utter catastrophe, had changed the fairly free world uh, that, that he had grown up with, uh, that was getting more and more open. Borders, you know, were, were kind of seen as more, uh, you know, before, you know, right up until 1914, seen as more of an artificial construct. And, and there was more, uh, you know, a lot of optimism about the future, about science and medicine, medicine and whatnot. And then the world just took a real unfortunate turn. And, um, and he was lamenting that it was, you know, so easy to travel in those kind of golden years before the First World War. And, uh, but then all of a sudden things had become very bureaucratic and difficult. And, uh, you know, we're feeling obviously the lack of travel more acutely now than, than ever. And uh, he said the frontiers, which with their customs officers, police and militia have become wire barriers, thanks to the pathological suspicion of everybody against everybody else, or nothing, uh, by some, but symbolic lines which one crossed with as little thought as one crosses the meridian of Greenwich. Um, and that was uh, from his, his memoir that he wrote uh, shortly before he died uh, in, the, in the early years of World War II, which looked, looked especially grim. And uh, so that's kind of the, so from, from here on out, there's signs of hope. So that's the kind of, uh, it's always darkest before the dawn, as they say. And um, so things, you know, things have gotten, you know, all these, all these forces that have been trying to limit uh, plant exchange. But then there have been also attempts to try to preserve the best of the old system of, of free exchange, especially with regard to plants that we use for food and, uh, and fiber and whatnot, the plants that we, uh, we most depend on. Because so many of those have become so international, you know, we think of, things like, like potatoes and rice and wheat and whatnot. It's very, very, very hard to, you know, sugarcane and, and so crops that, have, that, that are really, you know, they're already all over the world and many countries have their own varieties and for any one country to try to claim, uh, claim those as, as their exclusive uh, genetic heritage would, would just be a mess. Um, and, 
And so basically they were trying to preserve this, this 1983, the old international undertaking that was an attempt to preserve, originally attempt to preserve free, free exchange. Um, so at least, at least kind of uh, apply it to a, a limited group of crops that's now to 64 crops. And, um, oops, let me, oops, sorry about that. And, um, and so this is a multilateral system where there's, a, it's kind of more like something like CITES in the sense that there's, but, but kind of a nice, nicer version of CITES where it's, it's, it's an agreement to share and basically um, all countries use one material transfer agreement, which is called the Standard Material Transfer Agreement or SMTA. And so basically if you're doing breeding for the public good of, of a, one of these food crops, these 64 crops, um, then you, you, you know, you, you're free to exchange it freely. You, you know, you just, if it's only if you try to, you try to profit, um, like, but, but not just drop profit by say selling plants, but profit by patenting an improved variety that then you need to enter some sort of agreement. Then you need to promise to give some of your profits to the international um, system that, that administers this to help funds research for the public good on these, on these food crops. So that's been agreed to by, by a lot of countries and including, including the US. So, and because the US has a lot of, uh, a lot of the world's uh, germplasm uh, storage is in the US for, the, for a lot of these food, food crops. So it's important for us to be participating in that. And then um, the latest development is what's called the Nagoya Protocol on access and to genetic resources. And the fair and equitable sh sharing of benefits arising from their utilization. So you can say that five times fast. Um, and so this, this it, because the, the Convention on Biological Diversity, the big framework convention was so vague on so many points um, that a lot of countries didn't know really how to implement it. A lot of gardens didn't know what to do. Uh, so what it did was it, it at least provided some clearer definition of what parts of the convention originally should mean uh, some fairly some narrower definitions which which is a good thing um, so so one th one phrase from the convention on biological diversity that was uh, very debated was called utilization of genetic resources because it says you have to share benefits when you start utilizing a genetic resource. So once again, does that, you know, does that mean when you start growing it in your garden and enjoying its beauty or when your hummingbirds, you know, get to collect ne nectar from it and, and therefore are happier or something, you know, or is it like when you actually sell it or is it when you patent it? Is it when you get it, take a drug from it um, or all of the above? Um, so it, it defined it as Utilizing means conducting research and development on um, the, co the genetic and or biochemical composition of the, the genetic resource, in this case, a plant. So it meant that basically, if you're doing basically product development like a biotech company or, or, a, or doing, you know, or, or you know, a pharma pharmaceutical company, that kind of thing, uh, not just like selling plants at a plant sale or propagating them or, you know, even, you know, not really even uh, doing, you know, traditional plant breeding. Um, so, it, and it encourages countries to uh, try to enforce this by making checkpoints in their patent system. So that, meaning if somebody comes to uh, patent a new plant variety or, no, well, not so much, yeah, probably a new plant variety too, they would I think that would fall under it or, or, or a, they would, if they came to patent like a pharmaceutical or something that they, you know, some genetically modified plant or something, they would, then the, the patent office would say, okay, show me that you have this legally from whatever countries of country or countries of origin. And, you know, show me that you have, that they agree to this and you've made an agreement with them, which is a natural way to, uh, which, you know, seems like a logical way to uh, enforce this because it wouldn't involve us gardeners or anything, or even us botanic gardens, really. It's just because people are, what people are worried about for this international regime is the patent system. And, but like the convention that it's part of, it doesn't say anything specific. It just says, well, you might wanna do this or that. Um, and uh, this is the definition, but they don't even, you know, you don't even have to really, you know, agree to that definition. But what's happened has not been uh, kind of, it hasn't really clarified or simplified anything. It's actually, at least not that I've 
uh, been able to detect so far. It's actually led to a, a new wave of just very broad and very severe restrictions on uh, many new laws and regulations to say basically foreigners can't, you know, not making it much harder to access plants in nature in other countries, even for just for purely conservation or, or research or other sorts of just purely scientific research or even scientists in their own countries. Uh, it has become very difficult in a number of countries um, because a lot of these rules are not made by scientists in general. They're generally made by, by politicians and lawyers and uh, whatnot, like many of our, our regulations. So, um, and this is an article that was just published last year in, a, in an Argentinian journal by a couple of Argentinian botanists lamenting that after the Nagoya Protocol, that uh, things have become extremely difficult for them in their own country. For their own, and this is not just to export herbarium specimens or something to their colleagues that they're, they're collaborating with, but um, you know, they, they unfortunately, in, in response to this, some countries have made it even harder for, you know, they often haven't made it harder for, uh, Often the rules are fairly focused on on the science aspects. They're less focused on, say, trying to uh, you know prevent logging or those kinds of things. So those aren't seen as potential you know intellectual property activity. It's it's kind of this science that deals with genetics or living plant material or or even dried plant material that seems you know that, that's seen as a threat because of the intellectual property stuff so potentially associated with it if uh, if it gets in the hands of a pharmaceutical company or something. So a lot of a number of uh, you finding a number of these articles and cropping up in different countries by by scientists in countries with a lot of biodiversity saying, you know, hold, hold, you know, hold on here. We've got to uh, look at this again and not, you know, not kind of uh, stifle our own research just at the time when we need to conserve and catalog our biodiversity. And back in 2018 was a nice development, uh, at least from my view, was an article uh, in, in the journal Science, one of the main, uh, one of the top two uh, scientific journals besides Nature. Uh, this was mostly, this article was, was spearheaded by scientists in biodiversity rich countries. It was not, uh, it was joined by, by a number of scientists in, uh, in, the, in the developed world in the, in the more Western countries, but it was mainly scientists working in their own countries, 35 different countries, 172 co-signatories. Who are who are worried that that the bureaucrats and the politicians are have created a system that's basically slowing them down a lot at just at the time when biodiversity is under the greatest threat, not just from uh, what we you know the traditional within country problems like you know like develop you know deforestation, developments, agricultural expansion, but of course climate change and uh, just all the rapid uh, changes of our modern world. And it's a, it's a beautiful article if you would like to read. It's, a, it's, it's just a very well written couple of pages talking about, you know, that this, we know the intentions are good with the Convention on Biological Diversity and the Goya Protocol, but we all want to, uh, you know, make sure that the biodiversity rich countries aren't exploited, but we also don't want to, you know, while trying to trying to overcome the, the kind of old colonial heritage of exploitation of, of poorer countries. We don't want to kind of let this almost, you know, which what's the intellectual property system, which is actually ironically from those very colonial countries that, we're, that, that they're concerned about. We don't want that whole regime to, to then stifle our ability to, to catalog the biodiversity of in, these, in these countries. Um, and so that's the big, uh, the big picture of of what's going on uh, within this uh, kind of there. So that's mainly the, there's this, there's a little bit of a pushback now, an idea that maybe we've gone a little too far and just saying, well, we just got to make access very difficult. And a lot of gardens have decided to make access to their collections very difficult in response. And fortunately, there's a little bit of, because we've been trying this for, you know, uh, in various gardens for about 25 years now. And, um, and now we understand everything a lot better. And I think uh, I want to present some uh, ideas about how gardens, different gardens are approaching this and how I, I suggest gardens, that I, the ways I think might be the most uh, auspicious for gardens to approach this. Um, and gardens, uh, you know, 
sometimes if you know some of you may have may have approached a garden a botanic garden and said well could i you know i'd like to have a cutting of this i'd like to trade say a cutting of something from my garden um, and some gardens will say well we need you know we need documentation that your your plant is legal and they may say well we'll, we'll share with you this plant uh, but um, you know, or this cutting, but you have to sign this agreement that you won't share it further or you won't sell it or you or no one will ever sell it and you'll have to ask our permission if you do anything with it, stuff like that. So that, that does happen to people and, um, and it happens between gardens as well. Um, and, um, and gardens will also uh, often justify this by saying they have to do this because of the CBD, the Convention on Biological Diversity, to comply with it or to the Nagoya Protocol. Um, but the thing is that gardens aren't actually, you know, political, they aren't, they aren't actually sovereign nations, which the CBD and Nagoya are about governments, they're not about gardens. And, uh, and so what gardens do in response to this in most countries is totally up to them. So, um, and many, gar many gardens have, have, as I mentioned, adopted these material transfer agreements um, and restricted their plants. And, and these are their internal policies. Um, they're not something that the CBD requires of them or anything. Um, it may be required in a few countries now in Europe and whatnot that actually have national laws that are more specific. But uh, for, for you know, over 20 years now, uh, gardens have been doing this and it's, and it's voluntary and it's, and it's uh, and because, you know, a lot of the gardens haven't wanted to kind of uh, go in to reinvent the wheel on this, they've, they've took, taken the lead from the few gardens that have uh, lawyer input, basically. And so, um, and so one, of the, one of the drivers behind this, as I mentioned, was that, was that gardens you know, were worried that they'd be bioprospected. Um, but then the US gardens have not had these restrictions for all these years, and we, there's never been a bioprospecting scandal that I'm aware of or that anyone's brought to my attention when I've spoken to various groups about these issues. So um, that seems to not be, not have, not have panned out as a, as a major fear that, that, that we need to have. So that was the major driver be, behind these very restrictive policies. And, um, and because the convention, this international convention is an ongoing process um, that's, uh, that's, very, that's responding to a very rapidly changing uh, landscape of, of technology and intellectual property rights and our ability to communicate with each other um, through electronic means and what's called the Anthropocene, meaning the, the, all the environmental changes brought by humans. Um, I really think it's a good opportunity for gardens and also, you know, us, those of us who are also gardeners ourselves and uh, interact with botanic gardens in various ways through our, you know, many of our plant societies meet at them and whatnot. Um, you know, we, I think it's a good opportunity to actually find approaches that preserve the best of our ability to interact with the garden community, uh, with horticulturists and still do a lot of sharing and, you know, but still make sure we don't do things that will upset our partners overseas. And so um, what I like is a, this, a more open option, which is to abide by uh, what are called AB, the, the access and benefit sharing laws, basically laws that countries make uh, regarding access to their collection, to their, um, to their biodiversity. And that when we, you know, when a garden goes work, or a botanist goes and works in these countries, often they have to go through a process of, of figuring, of negotiating and figuring out what the, you know, what plants they'll be able to collect and under what conditions and the gardens need to, uh, are therefore required to abide by whatever the agreements they make, just as we all are. And, um, but then many gardens have decided to go on and, and, and put their own restrictions on their whole collections in addition to what they've agreed with, uh, with individual countries. And there really is no need to do that uh, with regard to, uh, to be in compliance with the, with the Convention on Biological Diversity. You just basically need to do what the, those countries uh, ask us and then um, and then the like the USDA for example or their germplasm banks uh, they they negotiate when they go and collect uh, in different countries for their to, to to keep them in the US germplasm banks 
and then they they make them freely available to anyone who who requests them who's a who's a bona fide uh, party in in the U.S. or overseas, and they and they may and they only base they they only agree to collect in countries where that country says that's okay. So that's an option for gardens to do too. And as I mentioned, some gardens do the highly restricted option that that uh, makes uh, where they basically give put a lot of uh, a lot of requirements on people who, re who receive uh, material from them. Um, and then there are intermediate options, uh, such as some gardens, like I like the Royal Botanic Gardens Edinburgh, has a, has a nice, uh, fairly, uh, you know, kind of fairly well-crafted and narrower agreements that, um, and some gardens actually have agreements that have an expiration date. They say, well, you know, you, you know, say can't share this for five years, but then after that you can and stuff like that. And some even use the standard material transfer agreement that's from the, the seed treaty that is used for um, for plants that like are from food and agriculture that says, well, if, you, if you're if you just gonna share it and not do any or, or even sell it, you know, propagate and sell in a nursery, it's okay. Just if it's only if you're gonna patent it that you need to, you need to enter into another agreement. So those are some other options that gardens have. And so I've I'm recommended and, and uh, we've, we've also ex tried to exemplify that at Fairchild to avoid adopting policies that limit access to, uh, to all these, uh, to these plants for, uh, that we have that aren't already, uh, already uh, you know, restricted basically. And also that gardens avoid intellectually getting involved with intellectual property uh, activities and focus on on doing plant work and horticulture for the public good, you know, freely sharing, not like doing stuff with pharmaceutical companies and stuff like that. And um, and that's really what a lot of these countries are concerned in as long as about and as long as we don't do that, and you know, show that we're we're not trying to uh, you know exploit anything, and we and botanic gardens generally aren't, and neither are gardeners. Um, then that's more in the spirit of the original green revolution where uh, where the improved varieties were freely shared with with the countries to help feed their people and uh, so there was there was a real reciprocity uh, going on and um, and there have been some efforts like what's called golden rice a, a genetically modified rice that that has a gene for making beta carotene uh, that has the potential to uh, avoid various types of blindness that occur in children that are malnourished in areas where they all they have is rice to eat and the rice uh, causes people to be deficient in, you know, they don't get vitamin A from rice, uh, which is necessary for eye development and vision. And, but beta carotene can be made into vitamin A in the body. So if they could make rice that makes beta carotene, you could avoid this common cause of malnutrition related blindness in many famine areas. And so a group of scientists have been working to do this, uh, but the problem is there've been a lot of patents in the way and they wanted to do it for the public good. But once again, this intellectual property system has made it very difficult. And if, and if the original, you know, genetically modified organisms had not been like Roundup Ready soybeans and stuff, but something more like golden rice that was actually to help people, the whole world would probably feel that this was a, that the old uh, system of, of reciprocity and exchange was probably still a good one for the world. But we've got, uh, we've got some work to do to get back to that, unfortunately. And, um, but the nice thing is that um, there has been at least one uh, study on whether or not countries restricting access to their, or even charging for access to their uh, genetic resources is, is something that benefits them. And this was a, a study that was done on bean uh, exchange of bean germplasm, um, the bean collections in Central America and Colombia. And they found that it basically was not, would, didn't look like it would be helpful for the countries to start charging each other royalties for it, as opposed to just freely exchanging uh, their, their bean uh, races to, uh, to breed. And so they, um, you know, but this is, this is one, of, this is the only study still that I've, that I've found that actually tried to do a cost benefit analysis because the policies that are at both international and national levels have, from all the people I've talked to who have been participants are driven by anecdotes, basically. Well, something bad happened in the past and we don't want it to happen again. So we're gonna employ this policy, not 
you know, well, if something bad happened in the past, we don't want to happen again. So we want to have a policy that we want to have a policy that doesn't cause something else bad to happen, but instead, you know, will solve the old problem, but not cause more problems of its own. And so, um, you know, there there is some some argument that keeping uh, free free exchange would still be would still be a benefit, and hopefully someday we'll get back to a more scientific cost benefit analysis of because because one thing that do, that is created from all of this is uh, more bureaucracy. Um, even when it doesn't necessarily benefit the countries of origin. So um, sometimes I've uh, sadly ended up calling it the Convention on Bureaucratic Diversity because it has created this huge uh, diversity of bureaucracies across the world. Um, and so basically I think the best uh, thing that gardens can do, the best approach is to focus on creating uh, beneficial partnerships uh, with, our, with people overseas and so that they benefit from from their working, collaborating with our gardens, as opposed to just focusing on you know focusing on restricting access to our collections uh, to people who want to grow those plants and share them. And um, and that's uh, that was the whole goal of the Convention on Biological Diversity was so that the biodiversity rich countries would see benefits from collaborating more benefits from collaborating with. Uh, people overseas in studying and, and growing and, and uh, researching their biodiversity. And uh, the image in the back there is of the wall Wallamai pine that was originally, when they were distributed gardens, they were put in cages. So uh, that was kind of a somewhat reminiscent of the situation. And so I just have recommended that gardens kind of be thoughtful at the repercussions of their not, you know, kind of sometimes implementing anti-sharing policies because you know those affect their relationships with the gardening community, and you know I've I've talked because I you know I work on all sides of this and and have friends on all sides within the gardens and in the plant groups and in you know and I'm I garden myself and everything and and uh, we need to I think we need to preserve you know the the beauty of plant sharing as much as we can, but um, you know and just avoid the the problems that have led to these. Uh, these difficulties and, and Dr. Norman Borlaug, uh, the father of the Green Revolution, uh, he, he was also worried that, you know, even back in the 70s and whatnot, that he was uh, starting to see this, this kind of uh, growth of bureaucracy that was going to make a lot of, uh, a lot of things much more difficult because he actually, it actually, for him to be able to get some of his improved varieties in to stop the famines in the uh, in India and Pakistan, it actually took the war between them to make it so that so that he could get through the bureaucracy more easily, um, because there was so much red tape uh, to even just freely give these these varieties back then. That, that you know, it took it took the war for them to say, okay, you can you can bring your seeds, and uh, we hope it doesn't come to that in general. Um, and one nice thing is that many countries are start have kind of developed a. a a freer uh, regime for for horticulture in their countries than they do for for scientific uh, collecting. And uh, for example, uh, one country that's been really good on this has been Ecuador. They've they've had a lot of nurseries that they're encouraging small businesses to uh, get bring some of their plants into cultivation from the wild and propagate them and then sell them overseas. And uh, now they're actually making some amazing profits because now we're in an aeroid craze at the moment. And, and so a lot of these countries that have a lot of aeroids, uh, you know, they're, that, have, that have been propagating these and, uh, and, then bring, and then exporting them all legally and whatnot to, uh, to the US has, uh, you know, it's been a way for, for these countries, even though the promises of, of big, uh, you know, pharmaceutical profits have, have generally not come to, to fruition that they were promised 30 years ago. But, but the, you know, just horticulture has proven profitable uh, for in areas that when, when there have been these uh, flowering and interest in houseplants, for example, during this pandemic, you know, there, there's a lot of folks who would otherwise be suffering a lot in these countries who are growing these aeroids and making good money now, so. And gardens can help uh, help encourage these kind of efforts by, you know, providing expertise and uh, and funding and whatnot to help these nurseries get off the ground, and then agreeing to buy their plants, and so that they the nurseries get a benefit, and those countries get a benefit, and the gardens get their plants, and 
to improve, increase their collections and, and can even exchange plants to them to help them the things that they can sell later. So there are a lot of uh, opportunities for, for creative uh, engagement with, with this new regime. And plants, as we all know in the plant world, plant sharing is the best way to share benefits. You know, there's nothing like the joy of exchanging our favorite plants for another plant. Uh, it's a much more satisfying usually than selling a plant because you know then you've both got something more, something that's got you know essentially unlimited potential to grow and propagate. And um, and as I mentioned, this is the this is a this is an ancient going back to what we said in the beginning the plant exchange of plants uh, among humans across the globe is a, is an ancient practice and it was uh, you know it. it goes back thousands and thousands of years with indigenous peoples and all sorts of uh, folks who were, you know, all the seed exchanges for heirloom varieties and whatnot. This is how we've kept all this agricultural and, uh, and even some uh, increasingly a number of plants that are extinct in the wild are, are grown by gardeners in botanic gardens and even in their home gardens. So uh, we can all participate this, this way and do good things. And um, I'll end with a couple of uh, passages that I like, uh, that are, I think are relevant to this, uh, like Wendell Berry, who um, said that, you know, when we can't, uh, you know, because a lot of this, this the regime that's developed with the, with the first intellectual property rights and then the pushback of, of the sovereign government uh, claims over biodiversity, it's based on, you know, basically what can we get? How can we make money from plants? And um, it's not based on, you know, these plants are wonderful and, and we value them because they're wonderful. And, you know, most plants, most plants we probably will never find a great drug from and they may not be huge, you know, have a huge role in an ecosystem, uh, you know, or something. But, but we still, you know, we as human beings can value them for how wonderful, beautiful, um, amazing they are and how wonderful it is to have this diversity. And, the, and the, you know, we, I think if we're going to, long-term be able to conserve plants, we need to value them that way and not in this intellectual property uh, kind of framework that's mainly about extraction and utilization and basically limitation of, of sharing. And, uh, and David Fairchild, you know, uh, he gained a lot of fame in his life from, from writing books and, and photographs and, and whatnot and articles and, and speaking. And, uh, but in the end, he really felt that the, that the thing that was most satisfying to him was, um, was the plants themselves. He said, what one collects in the shape of opinions, data, facts, and figures has a rather small chance of being passed on to others, a small chance of doing some good, as the saying goes. Whereas what one collects in the shape of seeds and plants has a very good chance of growing and becoming something worthwhile to somebody long after the shadows fall. And he was writing this uh, at the end of, you know, toward the end of his life. It was about 10 years before he, he passed on. And that was really, he said that in various ways uh, toward the end of his life. But it was really the plants. It wasn't his personal accomplishments. But, and I know we all uh, feel that to some extent that, you know, these plants that we grow and share, it's a special joy that we all share, just like we did at the beginning of this meeting. And, um, you know, and hopefully we can, uh, we can all in some way make the world a better place. So thank you very much. Be glad to uh, answer any questions. That was amazing. I, uh, I wanted to know, I, I saw that Australia was a country that was open to selling, but I have a friend in Australia who won't even, she's so afraid of sending me any seed from Australian Malvasiae because she says that the government is very restrictive. Uh, she's a major collector and also a uh, hybridizer of Australian hibiscus, for example. And she just feels like they're watching her all the time. Yeah, uh, Australia, they, they do have, you know, a way to to do it, it's not easy, <laughs> you know. I mean, it's it's. Uh, I was just kind of mentioning them as a country that has uh, at least has a, a system in place for exporting horticultural 
you know, they I mean it happens like like we, you know, they do even export like they they'll have rescues of cycads, for example, and uh, and that then can then be, uh, you know, when when there's a development going on that then can be sold even overseas. Um, and we have a couple of those uh, rescued cycads and they even have from Queensland and they have their special Queensland ID on them and whatnot. That doesn't mean that doesn't take a huge amount of paperwork and bureaucracy and it's often hard to do for small scale things. Uh, you know, uh, sometimes the, the systems are kind of more developed for major big money undertakings. And that's that's also kind of a, a process that's that's going on in the world, even with our own uh, USDA regulations that uh, like as the, like recently, you know, in the last eight years or so, they've been, uh, you know, placing restrictions on, on different genera uh, for importation. And originally the promise was, well, citizens would be able to request a risk analysis for uh, once they, when they restricted a genus, they could say, well, can you know, you could say, well, could, could you see if it'd be okay for us to immediately import this from this country? Could you, you know, do that analysis and see if there's a safe way to do that? Instead, they said the only way that can be done is if the other country decides to do it along with the US. And so you'd have to petition the government of another country to do that, which uh, generally a, an individual citizen can't do. And, and it can be similar in places like, like Australia, where, you know, I know it is, you can get a phytosanitary certificate to export uh, plants that are in horticulture and people do it, but it's, yeah, it's, it's difficult. Whereas in, in some other countries, it's much easier, but at least they have a system uh, that, that differentiates, uh, you know, directly wild collected plants and horticultural plants. Dr. Husby, I was wondering if I could ask you a question. Um, you went and picked up some plants from the Atlanta Botanical Garden and I'm just curious if the garden has made an effort um, to sell its plants directly to the public. Um, it seems like in this current climate, um, all nurseries have done well, yet botanical gardens don't seem to spearhead efforts to market and to distribute their materials to hobbyists directly. Sometimes the nurseries get that. Um, maybe there's pre-CBD stuff that uh, would be amenable to selling to the public directly. I think um, like the Rhododendron Species Foundation in uh, Washington State, which I just visited over this past weekend, one thing I really like about them is they make an effort to get wild seed, document the information of the provenance, and then sell to members and to the public at large. Isn't that something that uh, um, botanical gardens could do more of? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. That's a real opportunity. Um, but it's uh, it's also a bit of a challenge, you know, actually we're doing that uh, quite extensively at Fairchild because we ended up, uh, due to the pandemic, because uh, we ended up, you know, we, we have a tradition of having a few in-person weekend plant sales a year and we did our April sale online due to the pandemic um, and it was so successful that we just kept it going. and. Uh, and so it's been a way for uh, to kind of make up for some of the shortfalls uh, and, you know, also a great way to, to share a lot of plants with the public in, in safe ways. And, um, but, you know, that because of the, because of the kind of in the last 30 years, there's been a lot of emphasis and a lot of, even in the U.S., uh, botanic gardens all over the world to kind of find a, a niche in the modern world and a lot of a lot of gardens see their focus mainly as, you know, not just interacting with the public, but also in conservation and whatnot. And so often there's kind of a, a frowning upon the direct engagement with horticulture. Um, be, and, and, and a lot of that, there's also a holdover from that, that early concerns, uh, uh, you know, confusion about the conventional biological diversity, the idea, because a lot of uh, gardens thought that because it was the early document was so vague that they that they thought well, when they they you know it was thought that basically you shouldn't be doing commercial activity with plants at all, not just like biotech research, but is the idea was does selling a plant is that a bad you know somehow a bad thing for a garden to do, and so that's kind of been the culture in in many gardens, the idea that basically if a garden to make money directly off plants like a nursery would as being, you know, a bad idea. 
and uh, or but some gardens will sometimes still do that but like for example um, some gardens in Europe you know will have plants in their plant shops but they're not from the garden they're they're you know they bought them from a nursery uh, elsewhere uh, because they're worried that somebody will get upset if they propagate even unrestricted plants from their own own collections and I think it's a great opportunity I think it's a great I but you know I think it's you know I don't know if um, I haven't heard of any other gardens besides us really doing that during the pandemic. Um, but I think, you know, there's no reason why they couldn't. And I think it would be a great, a great win-win situation for the, but, but I mean, part of it's also just because these are this issue of the C Convention on Biological Diversity and whatnot, it's complicated. And uh, there's been kind of a, basically just one side of the story has been has has been the one that's that's basically everybody most people have adopted most of the major institutions and organizations have have adopted that approach and that kind of because i know i know that i think you know i know some gardens like i think i think that uh you know some i mean there, and there isn't even a really a strict reason like like pre pre cbd or post c because if you know if you if you collected a plant post cbd that you know and Followed the rules in that country, and the, and whatever agreement was made, if they had, if they even had laws at the time, many countries didn't didn't even create new laws for for many years, if ever. You know, if you didn't have any restrictions, if you followed the law and they didn't restrict you what you could do with it, you could still sell that plant, and uh, or still propagate it and share it freely, um, and still be abiding by everything in the in the CBD. And uh, so I think you know I think I think it'd be great to see that. And I agree. Can I just ask a follow-up question? I'm sorry, just my, this will be my, my last question, I promise. Just the reverse side of the coin. Does Fairchild actively seek material domestically from, for instance, hobbyists or other botanical gardens or even nurseries, especially nurseries that go out and collect in the wild? I don't know if they have the papers. I'm assuming they do. Uh, maybe it was just seed and they had the collection permits, but what is your policy at Fairchild for accepting material, and is it even welcome from hobbyists and other sources? Oh, we we definitely welcome engagement with with hobbyists. Um, we and we do accept material, but we you know, we do go through. You know, we want to establish that it's not you know something that's that's you know clearly of you know has some sort of, you know that was something that was taken illegally from another country. We don't you know, but we want to make sure it has a, you know, has a reasonably good pedigree that as far as we can determine, you know, it's sometimes it's sometimes it's hard to hard to figure that out. And we just uh, have to make a judgment call. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, we do, we do remain, you know, maintain exchange with, with hobbyists. And I think that that's a healthy and good thing. That's, um, I think it's a bit of an, you know, artificial thing to kind of just say that people who grow plants individually are, are uh, you know, somehow automatically suspect uh, because, you know, we're all, I think, you know, there, I know, I know many hobbyists who are, who are, if anything, even more stringent than many gardens are with regard to, uh, you know, the, where their, where their plants came from in terms of eth ethics and whatnot. And, but the fortunate thing is, like I said, that there are, there are an increasing number of, you know, we certainly make sure that at least what we have, if it doesn't have a direct permit, that's at least been artificially propagated um, you know, uh, in the country of, you know, that it's coming from before it comes here, because then generally most countries, once it's been artificially propagated and they've, and they've issued an export permit, you know, they've said, as far as they're concerned, it's okay. And, and, and that's good enough for us. We're not trying to second guess, uh, other countries, their sovereign countries. Some gardens have, uh, have adopted that idea that basically they're going to actually question other countries, whether they're, whether they're regulating their own export well enough, but you know, that's a bit of a colonialist attitude that I think it's not right for gardens to adopt, saying we're we know better than you, developing country, and uh, unfortunately those kind of attitudes sometimes sneak in, uh, and um, but yeah, I mean it's a it's a we we certainly I mean there are obvious there are obvious issues of, of real of super concern like CITES plants, you know, you want to tread very lightly on that. And plants that, uh, you know, I mean, there are certain plants we know are, are 
kind of, of special concern, you know, for for collect for over collecting in in the country of origin, like orchids, like cycads and stuff, which are also of course cites. And so we we you know other plants are are uh, you know they they just much more freely and easily enter horticulture and are propagated you know without having to to damage the wild populations and so those you know generally require less stringent oversights kind of do it on a you know case by case basis with the, the knowledge we have as as horticulturists and botanists thanks so much mm -hmm. I would like to um, put out the poll as far as um, seeing where everybody um, heard about the meeting and then you guys can continue to talk about, uh, ask um, Chad questions, but I wanna get this out here before it gets too late. So you can just say if you're a, a Cal Hort member or Western Hort member or a Mediterranean Garden International, Willamette Valley Hardy Plant Group, or if you're an um, invited guest or invited by a friend, if guys just, just put them on in there. Just so we have this information, be great. And once you do that, go ahead and ask Chad more questions, sorry. Yes, I have a question. And it's um, fine and good, and uh, the U.S. does a lot of imported plants. Uh, but how much, um, when you're talking about bringing in things from indigenous nurseries, how really phytosanitary can they be? I mean, with regard to uh, certain pests and diseases that are fairly endemic in horticulture like Phytophthora, for instance, which you really can't get rid of once you've got it. Yeah, I think we lost, uh, but I think you know, got the gist of that question. Chat, maybe. Yeah, well, that's, uh, that's you know, the, the the phytosanitary issue is is actually very. What? It's actually it's actually very that's very carefully regulated by both uh, the U.S. and overseas countries, and uh, you know there are about uh, thirteen hundred pages of of USDA regulations on plant importation. Fortunately, it's all one big PDF that we can search for relevant information, but. Um, so a plant to come into the U.S., you know, they all have to be bare root and free of soil, which uh, helps with Phytophthora and other soil soil-borne uh, diseases. And when you know the USDA is keeping very close tabs on where there are diseases of concern. So if there's any information on you know a type of Phytophthora that we don't already have, we already have a lot, unfortunately. Um, you know, they would they would you know definitely place stringent, if not a ban, or more stringent requirements on, on plants coming from, from that country. And, um, you know, and, and generally the countries of origin for these nurseries, you know, require these plants to be artificially propagated in artificial media usually. And, uh, you know, that, that makes it hard for the Phytophthora to ride along as easily. And um, they often will require treatments, fungicides, what not, and the plants are inspected in that country of origin, so where people know what the you know the, their own agricultural departments know what diseases and thing and pests to look out for, and they have to issue a phytosanitary certificate and they have to be bare roots, and they have to be under a certain size, and then they have to come to a USD Department of Agriculture inspection station in the US where they were inspected again. And uh, some plants have quarantine, you know, requirements where like, for example, bamboo due to various disease considerations have to be quarantined in Beltsville, Maryland for two years before they will release a uh, new bamboo import. Other plants uh, that don't have as much uh, potential agricultural impact as a, as a grass like bamboo would don't necessarily, or, or other fruit crops don't have as stringent requirements often, but uh, there's, you know, there's a lot of, uh, very strict uh, regulations on that, and you know, sometimes the you know in, in the you know in, 
in these tropical countries, uh, you know, we usually often don't have the conditions that some of their uh, pathogens would even like here in most places in the US, you know, we're not usually don't have to worry about being in a rainforest in the continental US or something like that. So, you know, it's a, there are all kinds of factors to consider, but, but it's, you know, there's, we're, there's a lot of stringent uh, efforts to avoid doing that. And, and certainly we, uh, you know, grow these things and, you know, in, in fairly contained greenhouses and we, keep an eye out for any developments of any unusual pathogens or anything. And we have the USDA just down the road. Uh, we can ask uh, if we have a concern and uh, we have plenty of things we can treat plants with. So we're, you know, certainly nobody wants to introduce another, another pathogen. So. Thank you so much, Chad. We appreciate the, all the information. It sounds like a tangled mess of relations <laughs> <laughs> to have to sort through. Um, we really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank Pleasure. you for coming. And um, remember, next month is uh, Carlos Magdalena and the party. So, anything else from anybody? Yay, hey, Chad. Thank you for so much. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank for us. We really appreciate it. <laughs> oh, it's my pleasure and, and you'll really enjoy Carlos next month because we, Carlos and I have talk, talk a lot about these issues. We're good friends. So you'll <laughs> Well, you'll have to join us then next month. Oh, I certainly will. I certainly wouldn't miss it. You become a member. I don't know if you know that for a year. Oh, wonderful. That's even better. Yeah. So you can come to our meetings if you want. And it won't be as bad for you because it'll be 10 o'clock in the morning, our time, which will be one o'clock in the afternoon for you. So that's not too bad. I will be delighted. Yeah, thank you. And the party. Oh, I wonder, yeah. <laughs> Okay, does anybody else have anything else? Yeah. Thanks, Ellen. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Good night.